Module 2, Framework for Community Road Safety Programs. This module is designed to establish the basis of a community road safety program. It commences with an outline of the key objectives which should form the core goals of a program and highlights the conditions under which effective community programs can operate. Mr. Taylor will start Module 2. In this module, I'm going to provide you with a framework for how a community road safety program operates. And there's only three things that I will be describing to you. One is the objectives that are suitable for community road safety programs uh, and, and which objectives can be achieved. The second thing is which road safety issues are appropriate and what things you might do in those projects that will make a difference. Some ideas for activities in the projects uh, that will be part of the Community Road Safety Program. Firstly, let's talk about objectives. If you're going to set a, pro a program operating, the first thing you must do is to be clear as you can about the objectives of the program. Time spent thinking about the objectives and writing them down will save lots and lots of time and effort later on in the program. Clarity of the objectives drives what you do. It also drives what you measure. So there's two things the clarity of the objectives drives. One is the actual program itself and secondly is the uh, evaluation of the program, the identification of its performance. That's why thinking about your objectives is most important. What are the sorts of objectives that you might consider putting in for a community program? Well, first of all, you might want to have an overarching objective to say one of the things we want to do with our community program is build an informed community about the road safety issues in our area so that we have strong advocates. Ignorant groups of the community are no value to you. Informed groups in the community are very valuable to you. So that's one objective that we might consider. The second objective is because you have a program which operates with local resources, with local personnel and agencies, you might want to have an objective that you want to mobilise local resources to assist in the road safety program. You might get assistance from the national or provincial level as well, but being able to mobilise local resources is a powerful objective. If you can show that you can do that for a local program, you will get support at the national level and the departmental level. So that's the second objective. The third and most important one from a road safety perspective is you should have an objective that you will be able to identify what are the key local road safety issues. They are critical for the community to actually assist you. They will w not want to assist you if you're talking about someone else's problems, but if you're talking about your problems, their problems, and you can identify that it's their problems, then they will come on board. A fourth objective might be it's quite appropriate for a local community program to say we have a similar problem to what's in the national strategy. Our most important problem might be drink driving and that might be the most important one in the national strategy. If those two coincide, having an objective to extend the national strategy initiatives into your local area is quite a valid objective. And again, that's a measurable activity that would flow from that. Finally, you may seek individual road user behaviours that you want to change or influence locally. It might be the children who leave the elementary school and cross the road and cross the road dangerously. You say, OK, we'll change that behaviour. It might be the uh, restaurant responders who come out of the restaurant and cross the road when they are alcohol impaired. You might want to change that. It might be, for example, 
uh, the drivers who drive down the major village street too fast. And you might want to change that behaviour. If you can identify the behaviour, you can tackle it. And that's an appropriate objective. So all of those are appropriate objectives for community road safety. Now before I move off objectives, I need to talk a little bit about limitations. These are things that I would doubt you should take on board. Local government involvement or the authority that is responsible for roadside um, furniture, what we call roadside furniture, or uh, signs, curbs, channelling, footpaths, uh, whoever is responsible for that needs to be a, a part of a community program. Because inevitably, whatever you do, you will find that you need to tell people something and you might need to put up a sign. Or you might want to put in a crossing for pedestrians. And so the authority that is responsible for those things needs to be a part of the program. Now that might be different in each country. I don't know all of your countries. In Australia, it's local government that has that responsibility. But it might be your city governance. I don't know whether it's, it, it might even be down to um, a village level. I doubt it, but it might be. Whoever is responsible for that, what I call small, low-cost, on-road engineering treatments, even things like putting paint or, or lines on the road, are often very valuable to a part of a program. That authority needs to be there. The final limitation is always remember, because your community program's strength is that it's a tight geographical area, it deals with something that people understand and say, that's us, that's its strength, it's also its weakness. It's a weakness because it cannot possibly have an, a big effect across the whole country or even across a whole province because it's so small. So always be aware that a community program of, of its nature is small in its scale and small in the degree to which it can influence the wider road safety behaviours. But it can still have a big effect in that local area. And that effect can be identified with your evaluation. Now, if we're going to do community programs, there are some preconditions. And these are preconditions that, that aren't written in any books. Nobody's written these down. These have come out of my experience trying to put community programs into parts of uh, Australia. The first precondition is you must have support from the national or provincial government, whoever is responsible for the funding and the provision of the major funds. They have to believe that your community program is a good thing and they have to be able to support it, preferably with some funding. If you don't get national or provincial government support, I think it's very difficult to do. Uh, it has been done, but never in a sustainable way without, without support from the wider government. And that's why if you were talk, thinking about what Eric Howard would have told you about the national strategy, I'm sure he would have said national strategy raises a number of things and if you're not in the national strategy, you're not supported. So if community programs aren't in the national strategy, it's just too hard. You need a stable delivery structure. You can't run a community program out of thin air. There has to be an organisation locally which is going to run it. Now it might be a, an organisation created for the purpose, like a, a, a local road safety council. It might be a, a lead agency says, I will, we will take the responsibility and have a committee to support us, like local government. It might be a village chief's community consultation mechanism. Whatever it is, you have to have a mechanism to, to enable it to operate. That's also a mechanism where people say, well, how's it gone for the last month? Who's reporting back to us? It's the accountability for the program has to come back through that structure. So you must have a structure. Local agencies, of course, are necessary and the local agencies will differ depending upon the program. But they must be part of the program. But as well as that, we need the local offices or the district offices of the major national departments. 
health, police, education, what have you. There will be local district officers, and I don't know in your countries whether those district officers have individual power to be involved in local things, but you can lobby for that to be the case if there isn't. It's very valuable to have the representatives of the national local government locally on the committee. NGOs are often powerful. They're often very good for advocacy. So don't forget there might be some key NGOs in your local community group area that you should incorporate. Red Cross, for example. Red Cross can say a lot of things that government can't say in supporting something that might be sort of like, well, we're not sure if this is a good idea or politicians are worried about whether it's acceptable. Well, NGOs can sometimes say, it's clearly what we ought to be doing. We'll save lives. <coughs> and they can be the messenger of a program. Uh, local media is, is critical to get your message out. Local, I don't, some countries will have local radio, but most will have local uh, newspapers and certainly village um, message boards. Those people who are responsible for those communication mechanisms, get them on board. Have them in your community program uh, so that as you develop messages or, or education, you've got an avenue for delivery to the local people. First thing, what should you do? The first thing in a community program is develop your own road safety strategy. What are we going to do? It's a plan. And that's a precondition. You can't run a good program unless you have a strategy. You must also make sure that you identify those local road safety issues. You will notice I'm saying the same things a number of different times, but you'll get the reason why. There's only some three or four critical things that we must do, but if we forget to do them, a community program won't work. What are the issues that community programs can work on? Well, here are, I've got six there that I think are effective. They're coloured blue. There's others I've put on this matrix that you might think about. The ones that don't have a blue colour, I think it are harder for community programs to undertake. Community programs can have an influence on drink driving. They can have an influence on speeding in the local environment. They can have an influence on local seatbelt use and restraint use, on motorcycle and bicycle safety, and on children's pedestrian safety, and pedestrian safety generally, particularly in shopping areas where you need to make sure your speeds of vehicles are low. They can also have an influence on where low-cost road safety improvements are allocated. Can we identify the most risky spots and therefore put a road crossing for pedestrians or have a curb extension that reduces the width of the road? A range of things can be done. I don't think it is easy for community programs to deal with these issues. Learner driver support, that's usually a national issue about licensing very hard for community activity to assist with that, with one exception. In countries that are large, fatigue of drivers can become a crash cause. Fatigue is not something that is easy to assess or address. And again, even if fatigue is identified by local people as something for crashes in your local area, I'd think twice before I tackled fatigue because I think the chances of success are very, very remote. Heavy vehicle safety, problem with heavy vehicles, and that is often heavy vehicles go through your local area, but they're relatively, rarely are they part of your local area. So it is very difficult to contact the drivers and the owners of the heavy vehicle fleets unless they happen to be in your local area. Vehicle safety, I've talked about major road safety improvements. I'm talking about big structures like public works, flyovers and major freeways. There's no way local community can influence substantially the design or the operation of those for safety. That is a, a, a national departmental responsibility, public works. And these are just some ideas for what you might do in a program targeting each one. The first one is drink driving. You could do these things in drink driving and these have been done successfully. 
Uh, you can have locally targeted police enforcement. You can have advice on the legal levels of alcohol consumption to drivers if you think they don't know. If they do know, don't bother. But if they don't know, they at least need to know what those legal levels are. You can provide breath testing in alcohol premises or essentially encourage those premises, particularly the big ones that sell a lot of alcohol, to say you should have a breath tester where people put coin in the slot and check what their breath alcohol level is so they're not over the legal limit. I think there's a, a real role for local community uh, road safety programs to encourage and advocate for, for major alcohol distributors in your local area to, uh, to do that. Educational materials, you can, you can get agreement from a lot of the alcohol providers and the restaurants. They'll take educational materials, they'll put them on the tables, they can put information to, to make sure people are informed. Some places in local area where there is particularly only one or two key areas where people will consume alcohol, there have been a community bus arrangement provided to take people, particularly at, uh, at high alcohol drinking times, away from the premises and back towards their home. So they're not driving or they're not riding on the road. Now there's a range of ways in which that sort of initiative can be funded. You can actually get it funded by the people who are the drinkers themselves, uh, if you think about it. But taking the people off the road is taking them away from the risk. So that Bus transport thing has been used in a number of places and so too of taxi vouchers where you will have a, a, an area where people are drinking uh, and they negotiate with the taxi company and will provide a subsidised cost so the taxi doesn't cost as much and the subsidy comes through the alcohol premises. Uh, that's a way in which, in which you can keep uh, drinkers off the road and drink riders off the road, particularly for motorcycles. Put pressure on the alcohol producers to produce low alcohol beer or low alcohol uh, products. That's really more a national level initiative rather than a local one. But you might be able to talk to local suppliers and get them to make sure they stock low alcohol products and perhaps make them more available at a cheaper price. And you can have advisory breath testing services in restaurants. And what's been done, I've seen people go into a restaurant with a breath tester and they'll talk to some patrons and say, do you know what your alcohol level is? And the person will say no. So they'll put the breath tester there, they'll breath test them and they'll say, what did you think you were? And the person will say, oh, I don't know, 0 0.02. And they'll say, well, you're 0.06, that means you're over the legal limit. Were you going to drive? Oh, I didn't think I was. It is advice to people about how many drinks they can take before they're over the legal limit. And that's been done in community programs as well. Speeding. Here's some of the things you can do on speeding locally. Local enforcement. You can have advisory speed signs on the road when a driver goes past. There are electronic signs. A driver might be over the speed limit. As he passes a beam, the electronic sign will come up and say, 65 kilometres per hour, too fast. Uh, and they are being used a lot in local road programs. And in fact, what's happened is a lot of local community programs will purchase an advisory speed sign. They're usually on a trailer that you could put on the back of a truck. Uh, and a number of community prog programs together will join together and purchase one and then share it when they're doing the speeding program. It, it provides instant advice on the road at the time the driver's going past and makes them think a little bit about the speed that they're doing in your local street. Data collection, you need to know what the speeds of people are doing, so you need to understand, collect the speed data. You can have on-road publicity, signage on the road where the drivers are passing. Media articles. Uh, Community programs can be a very strong voice for lower speed zones around areas where pedestrians are, schools and shopping centres. They need to be low speed zones. If they're not low speed zones, you can argue effectively that the local authority should make them lower. Establish local area traffic management devices to slow down vehicles like speed humps in particular areas. 
have footpath construction to divide pedestrians from the other vehicles, particularly in areas that are, have a lot of pedestrians and where there aren't footpaths, and that's often the case in many areas in Asian cities, and have road crossing treatments. A lot of things you can do, and some of those are engineering things. Seat belts. What can we do at a local level to encourage seat belt use? Uh, we have a survey of seat belt use to find out what, it, what the level is. We encourage the police enforcement to enforce seat belt use. Enforcing seat belt use is a bit harder for, for police, but they will do it if you, if you ask for a short period of time. The reason it's harder is it's difficult to see inside a car and see if a seat belt is properly um, attached or not. But they do have techniques for doing so. You can have media articles. You can promote the use of infant and child restraints. This is one uh, provision of infant restraint loan scheme for new parents. That was undertaken uh, in a number of com local community areas in Australia. Essentially, babies, if you're carrying a baby in a car, a baby will be in a particularly lie down state only until they're six or eight months. And after that, they're into a sit up seat. Uh, it is very expensive to get people to buy a baby restraint that they're only going to use for six to eight months. But you can run a loan scheme where people borrow one, use it, bring it back, pay for the cleaning cost, uh, and then it's used for somebody else. And they're very durable devices. That helps make sure that little babies, when they're going to be carried in a car, are going to be carried safely. Hospital policies requiring the use of infant restraints for all new babies who leave, provide educational materials, particularly for the need to replace seat belts if there's been a crash. If you're buying a second-hand car and you know it's been in a crash before, replace the seat belts. Seat belts are designed to stretch. And once they've stretched, they're no good. And encourage parents to place children in the rear seat of vehicles when they're travelling. Rear seat's always safer. You can do things on motorcycle and bicycle safety, police enforcement, the wrong thing there, it's not non-belt wearing. At pedestrian safety, you can undertake road crossing behaviour survey, you can establish a safe routes to school program, we'll deal with that tomorrow. Provide advice on safe behaviours to parents. Parents are the greatest risk around schools of anybody. Parents create most of the safety risk when they're travelling with their children to school. Uh, in their vehicles. Uh, advocate and implement lower speed zones around schools. Educational advice. You can encourage the teaching of safe crossing in schools and you can encourage parents to make sure that they supervise their children. Just holding their hand is the most important th thing. These are measures that can be taken at the local community level and so on. Finally, the difficult issues, and I'm repeating here a little bit, Heavy vehicle safety, you can see it's a major department transport responsibility. It's not for local fatigue related crashes I've talked about, vehicle design and manufacture I've talked about, and major road safety construction. They're the difficult issues and they're the reasons why they're difficult.